When the president is on the attack, he's bullshitting you. You're French. Yeah. What are you doing? That. Get out of our <laughs> politics. Google employees around the world walked out of their offices a week after the New York Times reported the company hid allegations of sexual assault against senior executives and rewarded them with exit packages worth millions. Walkout organizers published their demands for change, including pay equity, a global process for reporting sexual harassment, and an employee seat on the board. 29 states have a higher minimum wage than the federal government's, which has languished at $7.25 for nearly a decade. And it doesn't seem like the Trump administration is going to hand out raises anytime soon. Is a federal minimum wage is a terrible idea. Terrible idea. And will damage uh, particularly small businesses uh, to force them to take a kind of payroll increase um, would be silly. The Russian space agency, Roscosmos, has released footage showing the moment the Soyuz rocket launch failed last month, forcing an American astronaut and a Russian cosmonaut to make an emergency landing. One of the boosters, seen on the left, fails to fall away from the rocket, a mishap Russian investigators blamed on a sensor that was bent during construction. At a speech in Miami just days before the midterms, National Security Advisor John Bolton made it clear where the Trump administration stands on the governments of Nicaragua, Venezuela, and Cuba. This troika of tyranny, this triangle of terror stretching from Havana to Caracas to Managua, is the cause of immense human suffering. Today, two men of dubious credibility tried to convince a room of journalists that special counsel Robert Mueller is a rapist. <laughs> Spelled with an E. The correct spelling of the name does not have an E. I apologize for the typo. I will take blame for that because I'm partially blind. Mr. Berkman's incorrect. Her name is spelled with an E. Oh, with an E. Okay, it's with an E. I, I don't know. <laughs> it was a crass and distasteful event capping off a crass and distasteful election cycle. Sir. So, is the whole point of this to discredit Bob Mueller? And, 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 if, and if that is the case, do you really think that would shut down the Russia investigation? Uh, the, no, the point of this is not to discredit anyone. The point of this is to get to the truth. And the media, I don't know why, but there is this terrible sense of anytime conservatives are seeking the truth, they're somehow evil. Is Bob Mueller a sexual predator? That presser didn't convince me, but let's see if they actually file a police report as they claim they're going to do. This is the world we're living in five days before an enormously important election, a world beyond the usual nasty politics. It's a specifically Trumpian world of seamy hyperbolic attack lines coming at you so fast you don't have time to figure out what's true and what's not. Except that at this point, it's pretty safe to make a blanket assumption. When the president is on the attack, he's bullshitting you. The whole history of Trump's political career has been characterized by falsehoods, starting with the cynical search for Barack Obama's real birth certificate to the day one lie about the inauguration crowd, and leading up to this afternoon when he said this was Democrats' plan for dealing with undocumented immigrants. Once they arrive, the Democrat Party's vision is to offer them free health care, free welfare, free education, and even the right to vote. You and the hardworking taxpayers of our country will be asked to pick up the entire tab. Trump has been holding Make America Great Again rallies nearly every night. He's holding another one tonight in Missouri. And he splits his time on stage between calling reporters liars. The far left media has spread terrible lies and stories about the Trump administration and the tens of millions of people who make up our great movement, the greatest political movement in the history of our country. The greatest. And telling lies of his own. We passed a massive tax cut, biggest tax cut, for working families, and we will soon follow it up with another 10% tax cut for the middle class. Trump has shown a willingness to lie about a lot, but right now his lies are clustered around a few major politically advantageous topics that were on display last night in Florida. The first one is immigration. That has a lot of subtopics, like the caravan of Central Americans who are about a thousand miles away from the U.S. border. Democrats want open borders, 
And they want to invite caravan after caravan into our country, which brings crime upon crime. Now, we only anecdotally know who is in the caravan. Like any group, they are probably good people seeking asylum and bad people. But Democrats are certainly not inviting them to come. What Trump knows is talking about scary brown people gins up a specific part of his base who he wants to make sure vote for his chosen candidates. Another fun immigration topic that we've had to explore is the idea of birthright citizenship, something that most constitutional scholars believe is protected by the 14th Amendment to the Constitution, and oh, by the way, allowed people who looked like me in the 1800s to become citizens. And by the way, this is not a constitutional amendment. You don't need a constitutional amendment for birthright citizenship. Fact check. You can't change the Constitution without a constitutional amendment approved by three-fourths of the states. His signature on a random executive order isn't going to do it. The president is also trying to rewrite history when it comes to health care. And we will always protect Americans with pre-existing conditions. Always. Always. Protecting Americans with pre-existing conditions was what Obamacare was designed to do. What Trump is doing is trying to dismantle Obamacare piece by piece. And there are strong racial overtones at play here, which Trump doesn't seem to mind. The other day, he tweeted this video. I will break up soon, and I will kill more. It reminded a lot of people of another ad. Back in 1988, a group supporting George H.W. Bush for president ran the infamous Willie Horton ad. Dukakis not only opposes the death penalty, he allowed first-degree murderers to have weekend passes from prison. One was Willie Horton, who murdered a boy in a robbery, stabbing him 19 times. That ad is used in political science classes as a textbook example of racist political dog whistling, but at least Bush's campaign eventually denounced it. Trump has pinned his version to the top of his Twitter feed, which is followed by more than 55 million people. The most depressing part of the 2018 campaign season isn't that Trump is constantly saying stuff that isn't true. It's that it doesn't really matter. I do try, and uh, I always want to tell the truth. When I can, I tell the truth. I mean, sometimes it turns out to be where something happens, it's different, or there's a change, but I always like to be truthful. Let that sink in for a moment. Quote, when I can, I tell the truth. In other words, it would be nice to present objective facts, but when those facts might get in the way of his political agenda, no can do. Democrats haven't won a statewide election in Texas since 1994, and they haven't won a Senate seat in Texas since 1988. But that was before they found their great progressive hope, the boyish ex-punk rocker Beto O'Rourke. O'Rourke is trying to force conservative firebrand Ted Cruz's retirement in what has become the most expensive Senate race in American history. The two candidates have brought in a combined $109 million. But O'Rourke has raised the ire of Texas Republicans by raising piles of cash from liberals far from the Lone Star State. We're in the Lower East Side, yeah. in Manhattan, right. writing postcards for a Senate race in Texas. Tell me what's going on. Yeah. Every day you wake up to the dumpster fire that is national politics in America, and it kills you a little bit every day to see what's going on. These New Yorkers for Beto are handwriting stacks of postcards, which will be dispatched to unsuspecting Texas voters. Do you mind if I read this out loud? Oh, go okay. It. it sounds like an exaggeration, but it's true. This election is the most important of our lifetime for Texas. Please support Beto and all Democrats. Vote by November 6th. It does sound like an exaggeration, but I really believe it's true. A check on this president is extremely necessary, and the results of this election are going to mean a lot. But history shows that outside support and carpetbagger cash often have the opposite effect. It didn't help 2014 Texas gubernatorial candidate Wendy Davis, who raised more than $6 million in out-of-state donations, or Georgia Democrat John Ossoff, who lost in the most expensive House race in American history, with 95% of his money coming from non-Georgians. And Republicans are quick to portray O'Rourke as a lefty outsider. Beto O'Rourke! 
York in this state is running to the left of Elizabeth Warren, to the left of Bernie Sanders, and the state of Texas is not going to stand for it. Are you not a Ted Cruz campaign commercial? You're a Ted Cruz campaign uh, commercial. Think? Yes. People who <laughs> live in New York who's uh, French and from Berkeley? Oh God, the radicals are coming to affect our election. We're Democrats living in a very blue state, writing to people, trying to flip, you know, red seats blue. Of course, that's what we're trying to do. Why, you guys who aren't from Texas, you're French. Yeah. yeah. But like I tell what you- What are you doing? Like, Get out of our politics. <laughs> I'm a citizen and I always feel like I need to fight for that. Mm -hmm. And when you have this situation we have right now in the US, with Trump and Ted Cruz, and it's exactly the opposite mm -hmm. of what I think, mm -hmm. and what I've deeply in my, in my heart. Is it in any way kind of condescending to have this guy in New York sending these people in Texas say, like, come on, get out there and do it. I know better than you do. And you gotta get off your ass and vote for my candidate. I'm not saying that I know better than they do. The impact of this midterm elections is gonna go way beyond the state. So I talk to other people and I ask them, why are you supporting Beto O'Rourke here in New York City? You have a very different reason. Sure. Well, I'm his uncle. Even Democrats who aren't related to O'Rourke are just as starry-eyed about him. And their belief that he can win will either turn out to be prescient or embarrassingly naive. We put that question to James Carville, the godfather of democratic strategy in the South. Okay, Texas is much like America. They have demographic changes that are taking place, but the thing to remember, future American politics is this. We have always looked at politics as a kind of how whites vote and how non-whites vote. The big story is division among whites. Uh, there are people that have an algorithm that says that Texas is going to turn blue in October the 11th at 11.32 a.m. precisely. I mean, I, you know, who knows? But I, I think it's probably going to be a little bit quicker because you're just seeing this divide so pronounced uh, among whites by education and particularly by gender. To me, the most fascinating thing about Texas politics is this. Back in the 70s, when Texas started to turn red, the, the, the districts that first went Republican were districts like the west side of Houston and the north side of Dallas. Now, a good chance on election night that the Democrats take back these two kind of originally strong Republican districts because they both share kind of a same characteristic. They're both highly educated and uh, are not particularly enamored with President Trump and in both trending more and more democratic. These are some things you, you want to concern yourself with. What is turnout going to be in the Valley? The Valley is the Rio Grande Valley, that's South Texas. In Bear County and in, in those suburban where you have a lot of educated people, they got to really outperform where, what they've traditionally done. You know, same thing in Harris, same thing in Dallas County, same thing in Tarrant County, Travis County. I mean, that, that's where they're going to have to rock and roll. In terms of Beto O'Rourke, uh, it's long been the dream of Democrats that someone would come along and, and sort of energize the state and change the, the equation. And let's face it, he's doing it. Do I know that, that he's going to win uh, the 2018 Senate race against Ted Cruz? No, I don't know that. And most seasoned prognosticators say that, that, that the numbers are not just that point. I won't argue with that. I don't know what the numbers are going to be on election day. But I, I, I think the one thing you got to get better right, Texas statewide politics is not going to be the same after him. It, we're going to have BB and AB, before Beto and after Beto. Beto's going to be one of these rare people in politics that even if they lose, their impact is going to be pretty dramatic. Russia is trying to do what it did in the Soviet era and wean itself off of foreign money. The Kremlin retaliated against European and American sanctions over the invasion of Crimea by blocking those countries from selling it food. Overnight, more than half of Russia's meat, vegetable, and dairy imports became illegal. 
President Vladimir Putin has said the country could become self-sufficient by 2020. And to do that, the government is pouring in money and mirroring the countries it wants to do without. В Брянске я поработал два с половиной года на крышах, крыши делали. И потом кум меня позвал, говорит, пойдем, говорит, зачем тебе эти крыши, говорит, высота, все, ну пойдем попробуем. Oleg and Sasha are living the closest thing to an all-American ranch life that you can get in southeastern Russia. Нет, раньше никогда не слышал, что в России есть ковбои. Я знал только, что есть в Америке. Это тоже, это не легкая работа, но она очень мне нравится со сканером там, допустим, той же комплектации, либо с компьютером. А здесь я работаю на коню. А, с лошади, естественно, можно упасть. Being a cowboy wasn't even a job in Russia 10 years ago. Today there are a thousand of them. They work for Mira Torg, Russia's biggest meat producer owned by the oligarch brothers Victor and Alexander Leniak. Нужно как можно ближе становиться к лошади, чтобы лошадь не смогла ударить, а смогла только взять и оттолкнуть. Since 2010, the companies bought almost 2 million acres of ranch land. Some was abandoned, left by farmers who followed Russia's new economy, or by the collapse of Soviet farming collectives. While Russia doesn't want to rely on the U.S. for food anymore, it's not shy about importing American expertise. У нас в этом году уже более тысячи человек. Это тот фундамент, на котором мы строим свое будущее нашей компании. Bill George, a veteran Kansas cowboy, was hired seven years ago to oversee the expansion project. <laughs> well, there's no infrastructure and no resources in Russia other than land and inexperienced people. And so we imported cattle from Australia and from the U.S. We imported uh, approximately 500 horses from the U.S. We bought saddles for every one of those horses, which is a probably the largest order ever placed for saddles in the world. It's uh, approaching to be the largest cattle project in the world now. We expect to be at uh, 400,000 uh, mother cows in about another two years. It's at least twice, almost three times as large as, as any uh, cattle ranch in the U.S. He isn't taking measurements. He's diplomatic in his new role as middleman in a trade war. I have no political views on, and really haven't, and, and very seldom discuss any political views. I mean, my my goal is to do all I can to uh, advance the the company's uh, uh, benefit. Uh, but there's also been a lot of opportunity created in America by all the money we spent there. But the meat these farms process has been a challenge to sell to Russians who didn't grow up eating Big Macs and are budgeting in a tough economy. An aged steak costs more than some Miratorg workers make in a day. If ranches want to survive, they may need to depend on markets outside the country. But Miratorg is expanding, with plans to double its livestock by 2021, so it can raise half a million cows every year. Вот он мой приз, который я получил на участие Радео. Это, конечно, не первое место, но это лучший наездник, это вообще круто, просто круто. Знаю, что некоторые поля не пахались уже лет 10 точно, 15. Засеваются зерновые культуры, кукуруза, ну, корма, чтобы заготавливать на кормление скота. Брянская область за счет этого поднялась. Face tattoos and unkempt hair aren't usually a formula for pop stardom. But it's working for Post Malone. He has his own festival and just signed on to act in a Mark Wahlberg movie. 
Post's second album was the first one this year to go double platinum, while his debut clung to top 10 status longer than Thriller. But for every fan, there are more people fixated on a seemingly unanswerable question. Why is Post Malone so insanely popular? According to songwriting professors Kareem Clark and Brian Radar Ellis, it starts with his music, which is catchy because it doesn't try to be anything else. Post Malone's songwriting style is, uh, it's a bit repetitive. We've got a lot of 16th note rhythms uh, that'll maybe repeat for like three times and then go into like a nice ending phrase of the song Rockstar. I've been fucking hoes and popping pillies, man, I feel just like a rock star. Even if it's the first time you're hearing the song, you can kind of anticipate the fact that there is going to be that like down, like on the one phrase. All my brothers got that gas and they always be smoking like a rock star. So it makes it easier for the like the normal listener to be able to latch onto that and remember it and know what's about to come next. What came next for Post Malone was his first number one record, which makes sense. A USC study looked at thousands of songs and found that the more repetitive, the more likely it was to be a hit. That's because our brains love repetition. Post makes sure his listeners get addicted fast by starting off with the hook. You probably think that you are better now, better now. You only say that cause I'm not around, not around. Nearly half of his catalog follows that formula, and he's been using it more often. Maybe because he's incentivized to. Streaming services categorize one stream as 30 seconds or more of the song. So if you think about having a very short introduction and then jumping right into the chorus, by the time the chorus is done, you're already 30 seconds into the song. So even if someone wants to jump to the next song, they already kind of heard that memorable section. But the secret isn't just the special way he structures his songs. It's also his very not special singing voice. People find the Post's music is easy to sing along to because he doesn't really stray far from the root of the song. Uh, the notes that he sings are what we call diatonic, which means that they're in the scale degree of what he's singing. Damn, my AP going psycho, no mama bad like Michael, can't really trust nobody with all this jewelry. It's different from a Beyonce. When she sings Love on Top, you know, when she gets to the part where she modulates, in other words, she goes from, from one key to, to a higher key to, to a higher key. To to a higher key. At a certain point, the average listener is just not going to be able to follow. For artists like Post or artists like Rihanna, they tend to just work inside a specific limited range of notes that complement their voice, but also complement the average listener. Post doesn't just sound average, he looks it. Some of his fans even tried to get him a free makeover from Queer Eye. He's very much aware that he's a meme, and that self-deprecating, goofy persona softens the image of a gun-toting rapper. Though, Post doesn't consider himself a rapper, and neither do the Grammys. The Recording Academy classified his latest album as pop. The move confused a lot of people, understandably, because if you listen to the radio, it's not clear whether pop is defined by melody or melanin. Since 2012, just eight rappers have gone to number one on the pop radio charts, and six of them were white. Streaming's influence is growing, but radio play is still the most common way listeners find new music. And Post Malone is getting a lot of it on pop stations, hip hop stations, and alternative stations. His songs work because they have the visibility to work. To someone who doesn't listen to a wide range of stuff through the course of many years, Post might sound unique. But yeah, nah, he's, he's, he's wearing the formula on his sleeve. 